Welcome back to Division One Rejects. <laughs> We'll address it right now. Jimmy Martin is back with me tonight in studio, not over Zoom. Uh, you're going to be here able to hear him the entire episode. You will not be able to see him. Um, why don't you stand up and stand up and run over here quick okay, just to prove okay. your existence? Okay, I will, I will. And then we'll go back. <laughs> I, uh, I've been using my cameras here for my big boy job at Northern, and they're still in the studio. Can't get into it right now. Yeah, yeah, he's very much he's very <laughs> he's very much here and, and real and in person. Um, he will be with me uh, for the for the majority of of this episode. wasn't here for the guests, um, but we got a great episode today. It's episode one hundred and sixty nine of D one Rejects. Lucas Mello, the defensive line coach and defensive recruiting coordinator from the University of West Florida D two team down in the Gulf South. He joins me here shortly to talk a lot about the Argos and their brand new stadium that's going to be built down there in Pensacola, Florida. That's going to be exciting. Defensive recruiting coordinator. That's not specifically a title I've heard very often in college athletics or football specifically. Yeah, I can't say I have either. <laughs> right? You have a recruiting coordinator on most staffs, even at like the Division two or Division three levels. That kind of gets designated to a certain individual, but they split it up by side of the ball. I like that. Yeah, interesting because like you would think it's usually by region. You'd be like, oh, Southwest Georgia. Or yeah, like, kind of each coach like gets their own yeah. area. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, But, I mean, by the rationale of you can do co-offensive and co-defensive coordinators. Mm-hmm. True. Have you ever seen a co-special teams coordinator? Have I? I don't think I've really. I don't know either. No. So we'll talk with him about a lot of great stuff here soon. But uh, otherwise, headlines: we got a D two team in Texas in the Lone Star Conference picking up a D one opponent already scheduling out for twenty twenty seven. Hello. Three years from now. Uh, we'll talk about that one. It's a pretty cool matchup. we got a new program down there. They're trying to pick up some games out of conference. We have a, uh, a list, a compilation, if you will, of the top NAIA transfer portal classes graded right now as of Athlinked. Have a, a fun new partnership with them where I have access to a lot of their data and be able to give you a little bit more in-depth analysis of those transfer portal classes and what exactly those rankings all mean. So I'm excited to talk about that. And then finally, Jimmy, a sick D3 football cover, because why not? Oh, yeah. The game officially is out. This is uh, This is July 15th. Uh, the new college football is out. I have a PS4. I ain't playing it. See, like, I am so bummed. Uh, some self-disclosure here. I have an Xbox, and mm-hmm. it is old. I got it when I graduated eighth grade, Xbox One. And it is, it's on its last legs. I don't know oh, if yeah. it's even going to turn on anymore. Yep. So I need to do something about that because I want this game. I, I just, do. I, I really want it. I, I can't warrant this game. Like I, I wasn't someone who – I played some of the old ones, obviously, but – I don't really, I'm not a Madden or a 2K or a FIFA. I don't play much of that stuff. I cannot warrant buying a whole new console just for this. I can't get my head, I can't wrap my head around uh, it. I, I mean. I can't. I would, I need it. It's like that SpongeBob when he's like in the Sandy's Dome and he doesn't wear. Uh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I need it. That's me right now. Dude. As always, if you're watching this episode on YouTube, bottom of the screen there, that red line, the video chapters, timestamps in the description. Otherwise, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the different time uh, timestamps and video chapters will be in that description on those platforms. But uh, before we get into any of those headlines, let's get right to the conversation tonight with Coach Mello. Join the show tonight. Reigning from Pensacola, the defensive line coach and defensive recruiting coordinator for the Argonauts at West Florida. Now, friend of the show, Lucas Mello. Coach, what's going on, man? Uh, not too much, man. Enjoying, uh, enjoying my summer. A little time off uh, right before we get back in the swing of things here on Thursday. So, Oh, yeah. Ready to get back in the office. I'm going to put that title on you now. I, I figure anyone who comes back on here, especially in your case, excited to be back on here, which I love. I'll throw you that title, that friend of the show. You take that and run with it um, yeah. if you like. But I'm excited to have you back on here, man. It's been a minute, and we've talked in the past about guys like Jake Dorn and John McMullen. Uh, I just want to know who you're poaching from the Mitten State next and taking back down south with you. Anybody? No, nobody from the GLIAC. Uh, you know, okay. we, we got a couple other uh, key guys from some other conferences, but uh, stay away from the GLIAC this year. Okay, that's good. a lot of coaches are gonna are like, like to hear that one. Obviously, pretty uh, late in the process now, but. Still a lot of teams trying to figure out what they're doing with these uh, with these transfer portal classes, man. I'm sure you're no, you know, that's no secret to you guys. You've got a, a talented squad down there. But the news recently with the Argos down there, um, obviously you have that success and you know, cemented yourself as a playoff team and a talented conference. The news has been off the field uh, or more about the field in particular, right? The Here for Good campaign down there. Some generous donations. You guys are building a hell of a stadium down there, but there's so much more to it than just the facelift for the football program. Talk about that for people maybe not familiar. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I think it just speaks on on the commitment um, from the top to bottom, you know, and, and anything from the president, the AD, obviously the donors, um, you know, the community, 
everybody's involved. Uh, everybody's bought in on winning the championship. Everybody wants to make this first class organization in every aspect of uh, of things. And um, you know, I think that's one thing that we needed to uh, cement, which was you know, new stadium, new facilities, things like that. And uh, you know, it, it's bought in as far as got a new training room going in. It'll be done this before we start the season up, um, which is going to be awesome. And then obviously we got the stadium getting built. That's going to be started as soon. They're going to start construction on there as soon as they're done with the with the training room. So okay. excited, really excited for the future. So it's going to be nice. That is that is awesome. And uh, I know for it, it's hard sometimes with you guys to keep perspective as just a fan of football or maybe for more casual fans of Division Two football because of the recency of this program, right? With Coach Nobles coming in and stepping into that position now, kind of cementing there's a little bit of history now um, that you can start to build. If you can even call it that because it's been in the last decade, right? But sure. um, when you start a program and you get to the national stage in less than five years, and now all of a sudden these expectations are being thrown at a program that no other program has thrown these these hefty, uh, lofty goals in the first couple years of, of starting up and playing ball. But you guys have responded to that. It feels like very much in the right way. And before we talk more about the stadium, talk about just the staff and the way you guys are able to handle that. Uh, I'd assume that's obviously Coach Nobles all the way down uh, through all you guys. Yeah, no, it's uh... – you know, when you when you take a job here and you start working here, you obviously know that the, the expectations are are extremely high. You know, it's not. I tell people all the time, this is this isn't just a football school, right? It's a there's 15,000 students here. Every single sports program is extremely successful. Uh, we got more conference championships than any uh, school in the country for, as far as all sports combined. Um, so it's been very successful in every aspect. Um, so we know what the expectations are. You know, it's we know what what the standard is here. Um, so in order for that to happen, you got to continue to find different different ways to continue to grow and continue to get better um you know so that's that's pretty much how how we all feel you know so we we got to continue to do our part now and just bring the best players uh on campus and and continue to win Absolutely. And you had mentioned when you first came down to Pensacola that Coach Nobles was a big part of that decision for you. And obviously coming back down to the state um, that you know you grew up in and that kind of homecoming in a sense as well, I'm sure is the big piece. But we know what kind of recruiter he is when it comes to student athletes. What is the pitch for guys like in your shoes coming down? And and you had said before you weren't looking for a new situation or, or things of that nature, um, but this just felt like the right fit. Talk about uh, him and his leadership style and how he's able to to really motivate in that way. Yeah, I, you know, I, I tell people all the time I was I was very content where I was. You know, I, I really enjoyed where I was, um, but there was a, a couple places that uh, you know obviously would bring some interest to me, and West Florida is one of them. And then when I finally got a chance to talk to him and you know, we, we kind of talk philosophy and, and not just philosophy X's and O's wise, but just life philosophy as far as um, our ultimate goals for our student athletes and ultimate goal for the team. I think we had a lot of the same vision, a lot of the same perspective, on a lot of things. Um, he's great. You know, he's, he's one of the best leader of men I've ever been around. Don't let the age fool you. Um, he's uh, he carries a lot of weight and, and he does his part and he gives us as a staff a lot of freedom to, uh, implement things the way we want it to be done as long as it all ties in with the ultimate goal of the program. Um, so I think that that was a big thing, obviously, aside from the location and um, yeah. you know, all, all the great things that Pensacola brings and just the state of Florida brings as a whole. Um, it's just that championship mindset um, and just, you know, a big thing that the whole university uses all the time is just building champions for life. Um, so it's great. You know, it's it's ties in everything I believe in. Hell yeah. And you're very quick to give him his flowers, which are well-deserved. But also from what I've heard from just about any guy that I know that has, that has had the chance and privilege to, to play under you is they all say the same exact thing. And, and they are, they're ready to run through whatever wall they end up or stadium they end up building down there for you guys. But let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about um, maybe potentially some more of the fun part of, of this and this stadium and these renders that uh, are released. Talk about this and kind of the grand vision that goes into the next stages, the next step, uh, steps rather, of this football program. Because when you look at it, just the actual image and setup of what you guys have planned down the pipeline, this is going to be arguably one of the, if not the best and kind of premier stadium uh, in college football at this level across the country. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, I think that's the goal. You know, obviously I had nothing to do with uh, the – the building of it, I don't think anybody <laughs> in, the, in the football you know department did. But Maybe we need to change that. Maybe we need you guys out there in the hard hats. That could, you know. The, you know, they whipped out the video of it uh, in a full <laughs> athletic staff meeting. And we were, I think everybody's jaw dropped and said, oh, my God. 
so it's you know what whoever did it whoever uh, put it together did a phenomenal job yep um just excited to see it uh you know come come to life you know it's uh i think the goal like i said everything at, at our place is we want to be first class we want to be the best at every single thing we do so that is the goal and that was the goal and when when building this thing you know i've been to some really really nice stadiums at the division two level and seen them but i think uh if this isn't the best it's going to be right up there yeah i I'm with you. I'm with you in that regard. And uh, the images that have been posted and released by you guys, along with some others that I'm sure are, are floating around within that facility and, and that campus over there, I'd imagine that's already become part of the recruiting pitch, along with some of those uh, other pieces of the vision and kind of trajectory of this thing. Yeah, a little bit uh, with some of the, the later guys, right? Um, yep. You know, you, you, you kind of try not to get too far into it yet, just because, you know, obviously at this stage when we kind of found out about it, we were pretty much done with our high school recruiting, yeah. um, which would be the guys who would essentially uh, get to enjoy it the most. Yes. Um, you know, yes. some of these one-year guys may not get to see the full thing complete yet, but it'll be cool for them when they come back to, uh, you know, see what, what they help build. I was going to ask, and that's kind of an interesting piece too, is because like a piece like this does not just show up uh, August, whatever, when you guys do start officially fall camp, whatever the report date is for you guys. So, you know, when you're recruiting these, you start talking to these, like whether it's juniors in high school or, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. then you can, yeah, you can start to have these serious conversations of like, hey, by the time you get a degree from West Florida and you graduate, this is going to be what's going on, man. Like this is, we're going to have this thing fully implemented. But uh, those conversations with the, like you said, those transfers, the grad guys that got maybe one, two years, got to yeah. be a little bit different, but you touched yeah. on it. Is that, that's part of the conversation of like, hey, come here to a program that's had success and just continue to build that. And then you're going to be able to come back and, five years, 10 years, 15, and, and now really see the the fruits of your labor in a sense of, of what you've helped build? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, you know, you want them to have pride in in, in the university, right? I think sometimes you lose that when, when recruiting transfers is, you know, they, they obviously have spent more time at the last school they've been at. So um, yeah. sometimes they don't always uh, identify themselves as a lifelong Argo or whatever program you're at. Um, you know, but that's one of the things we want them to to appreciate and and um, invest in, essentially, right? Yep. Um, and just obviously be excited for the program as a whole, not just for the one year they're going to be here, and so on and so forth. Those guys are going to be here for longer than a year. Then, um, obviously, they'll they'll have some fruits of the labor, right? They'll they'll be able to enjoy it at some capacity. Maybe not the full thing completely done, but. Uh, yeah, and you're going to have some guys that come in, you know, for those those shorter stints. Giles this last year is a great example of a dude who's now pursuing a big-time pro opportunity. How, for guys in that case, where you know um, there's a lot of players who are coming to you now where you've built this status of being a playoff contender, of being a team that's going to play against some really tough non-conference and in-conference opponents we'll talk about here in a second, but now you're going to have a lot of these guys kind of uh, attracted to you how do you get them to to buy into – obviously, the football is going to sell itself, right? When you have a culture and you get people to buy into that, um, you either right. get with it or get out when you're at this level. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about feeling really invested in a community, in a campus, and kind of that family atmosphere, what do you do for those guys who are here on uh, on the short term as opposed to right. those long-term guys that you develop over three or four years? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. That's, sometimes that's difficult. It's been difficult in other places I've been. You know, it takes some time, you know, and uh, – we, we do things a little unique here. You know, uh, one of the biggest things we really set forth on trying to do this year was signing our, our transfers mid-year, right? We, we signed a huge class uh, in December. And when I say huge, I mean we signed like 16 guys, which was the most that had ever been done here before. Yeah, in the relatively, past. right? Relatively. You see right. some crazy uh, numbers out there. For sure. For sure. I mean, we, we did it at Davenport a few years ago. We signed 35 guys mid-year, which turned the whole program around, right? But – we we're not we're not here trying to change or rebuild the whole program. We just had a few spots that that we had to um, you know refuel at, and you know the biggest reason for that is for them to buy into the culture, for them to um, learn learn the system, learn learn the way we do things, and obviously just um, be here for as long as they can. You know we we recruit guys we love being around, guys that we enjoy um, being a part of the team, and we want them around as long as we can. Um, you know, unfortunately, some guys uh, run out of eligibility and it is what it is. But, um, you know, we just welcome with open arms, the family atmosphere across the board here um, and just try to show them as much love as possible, um, whether they're they're going to be the starting quarterback or they're going to be the fifth D tackle on, on, on the depth chart. Yep. It's all, you know, you, you just embrace those guys. Those are our guys. Those guys we picked. Those are the guys we hand selected. So. 
and all like that. Mid years is a big part of that too. And I've seen uh, a lot of guys now that I've been through the process. I've seen a lot of guys benefit from that. And I think um, obviously the sooner you can just get a guy on campus and have them working one in your facilities, but two with their teammates and with the coaching staff and the strength staff and everything that comes with that, you're taking away that acclimation period, right? You know, a lot of that is is taking care of itself as opposed to just potentially showing up on a on report day one of, of camp, uh, trying to get guys up in the summer and, and doing a lot of those things. But the earlier you can get them on campus is the better. Uh, but mm-hmm. you don't both know that sometimes there's a struggle that comes with, okay, you want to get a guy up at mid-year, you've got to get him a place to, obviously you aren't a travel agent, but a place to live. And maybe he's got to get a job. He's got other people to uh, take care of. And there's a lot that goes into that. And I don't know if people really appreciate, you got the Nike hat on right now. There's a lot of people that wear probably four, five, six, seven, eight of those uh, trying to get these guys situated and on campus. That's got to be a tough piece to navigate. Am I on the mark there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's why a lot of people have a hard time getting uh, major guys in. You know, uh, D2, that's the beauty of small college football, man. There's just so you, – you have to wear so many hats. And you have to have guys on your staff that are willing to do that. Um, if you think you're just going to come out here and coach X's and O's, you are in the wrong business, right? It's um, – like you said, it's – you you got to be a travel agent. you got to be able to help these guys find flights. you got to help these guys find housing. got to make sure that they're, uh, you know, getting with the academic advisors, getting – you know, and our school is not easy to get into. You know, I don't know if a lot of people realize that it is it is a very uh, rigorous um, institution to get into. Mm-hmm. So it takes a little time. So it, it, those are some of the challenges uh, in bringing mid-year guys. But you got to be you got to have a plan in place. And uh, I think that's one thing we we did a great job of doing this year. And we, uh, you know, I think we killed the mid-year signing class. We have a couple pieces that we, we have to fill um, right now in the summer, but nothing like it was last year. Like last year, we had to rehaul a whole roster. You know, this year it's not the same thing, so um, we're excited. Hell yeah. Let's talk about this year, something you guys do have locked up 100%. Grand Valley State, you bring them in. I would, I believe it's – is it be the week four slot for you guys? you got a buy built in in that second week too? Is that how it stands yep. right now? Yep. Okay, there you go. So week four, 28th, you make the trip up, at least for this year, uh, up to Allendale. You talk about stadiums. Not many in the country that get better than Lubbers, uh, and that's a, that's an environment that is going to be ridiculous. But you guys bring in the Lakers this year for the schedule. I mean, the matchup speaks for itself. How did this come into play, and what was the reaction from the guys? Uh, I mean, everybody's super excited. You know, I think it's uh, – that's why you, these are the type of games you come to West Florida to play in, right? Uh, we're not going to shy away from any competition. Um, I think Grand Valley does an unbelievable job of doing that. You know, they go out and, and schedule some of the – toughest schedules in the country absolutely and you know and i think some of those things they they don't have an option they have to because a lot of teams don't want to play <laughs> yes. you know and that's uh when when you're at that top echelon of of division two that's some of the issues you run into um you know hence the the bye week there you know so that's it's it's exciting man it's uh you know last year we got to uh play fam at that same slot you know mm-hmm. and uh so we decided that it was probably better for us um, when it comes to playoff seeding and all those different things um, to go play a top division two program versus an FCS program. Um, because obviously if you get, if you beat those guys, you know, it carries a lot more weight than, you know, beating an FCS program, yep. which won't help you whatsoever. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot and of that's a whole other conversation, right? That's a whole nother. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's absolutely. a whole, whole nother uh, yeah. rabbit hole there, but <laughs> it is, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting. You know, you get to match up, see how, how good you really are against one of the top programs in the country. I'm excited for that one, personally. That That is going to be that's going to be a big-time uh, matchup. And still relatively early in the season, teams are still trying to figure themselves out. Uh, we were treated to a great contest last year, that Minds GV, to open things up uh, as far as the season is concerned. And and you talk about it, man. They've gone out of their way to do that. They're going to be battle-tested and hard, and they lose a lot. Um, but the expectations are still just as high. Same for you guys. You graduate a lot of big-time pieces. You've got multiple guys pursuing these professional opportunities that they've been uh, blessed and fortunate enough to, to be a part of. But... Now you got to go and do it again. And that's, again, the beauty of college football at every level. But you mentioned the the playoffs and kind of the implications of a game like this in the playoffs. Now, those playoffs could be potentially changing here. And I've, again, expressed my distaste potentially for those super regions and other things of that nature at the D2 level. But the quote here, right, from the commissioner of the MIAA, it says that the D2 Championships Committee is recommending the Management Council eliminate bylaw 18.4.3.1, just in case you have your rulebook handy, which requires sport committees to pair teams strictly within their region as the group works to enhance its regionalization bracketing model. Layman's terms, potentially no more super regions. How do we feel about that? And is it much of a surprise that something like this is is potentially coming to fruition for you? 
I think it's great. You know, um, I don't know how it how it plays out ultimately at the end of the day um, for the simple fact that, yes, that's in the bylaws. But, you know, the committee has always had the opportunity to, to move a team to a different region. You know, it they just don't do it. Yeah. You know, or that, I should say they don't do it often because they did it for our region this year. Um, I think it was Virginia Union got shifted uh, to our region. Some, something along those lines happened. Um, somebody left, uh, I believe it was – the same region as the PSAC and came over to us okay. um, and played in our super region. So they, that's always been a, a possibility. Um, but I think it's always been more focused on travel and just what's feasible financially for, for programs. Right. Yep. Um, so I'm very interested to see how that, how that plays out. Cause obviously this is the way I took it. Um, and I'm assuming a lot of people are thinking the same way is this is to avoid those fr- round one by or uh, round one rematches. Like we had this year against Delta, Mm -hmm. um, playing them, you know, after having played them three, four weeks before, you know, GV, Ferris, you know, all all that nonsense that happens every year. I think it's great for the sport and and for Division Two as a whole to just not run into that issue. You know, let's just get uh, seating done based on, uh, you know, however they want to do it, uh, based on record um, and all that other stuff. Yeah, and I think the example I always look back at is the FCS level, right, which can be semi-comparable. Sure. And the fact that you can have a South Dakota and North Dakota playing for it all in the national championship game when they are rivals and in the same in that Missouri Valley. Like, they that's definitely got to figure it out. Right? Yeah, like that, they, they got to figure it out. That's ball. Like, that's ball. Mm-hmm. And so, for me, you know, there's plans for uh, kind of a slight – slight rearranging of those super regions when conference Carolinas uh, does bring right. in and sponsor football. And that's going to affect you guys quite a bit as well, because you'll uh, lose a couple members over there. But um, I was going to ask, because you brought it up already. Super region three seems to be at the focal point of that conversation. Every time it's brought up, uh, I- I'm very partial to it just because I know I'm in this area and I see all of it. You've been a part of this region of football, you know, the talent up here. Uh, Harding is just kept it in the conversation this last year. But uh, I was going to ask, you kind of already touched on it, how does this affect West Florida? And I think the biggest thing, like you already mentioned, are those first-round rematches like Delta, like a Valdosta, those kind of squads where, once again, if you set up potentially in a different manner, those kind of top headlining-type matchups, why aren't those happening in round two or three or, or something where it maybe reflects more uh, of the level of both these teams? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if teams are as good as, uh, you know, they think they are, it's it's not something you can avoid yeah. to completely avoid a rematch, right? But you would just hope those rematches aren't happening um, in the first round. Um, you know, and, and like I said, it's at the end of the day, you're going to play them whenever you're going to play them. But oh, yeah. just for um, the thought of let's have the best bracket, let's let's make sure we try to get the best two teams um, playing um, later on in the in the bracket. You know, I think that's that would be awesome. It'd be great for for the sport as a whole. Hundred percent, man. I'm with it. I hope we uh, I hope we see the day one that that uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony or whatever happens down there in Pensacola. I want to see that day here as soon as possible, but also the day that we can uh, get this playoff deal figured out. The uh, the constant though, and what I know I will see is uh, this Argo squad back in the dance here. They're gonna make a lot of noise this fall. I'm excited to follow along with you guys, man. Uh, excited to hear you're doing well and, and just. Overall, just pumped. I appreciate you coming back on, spending some time with me, Coach. Absolutely. Appreciate you, man. You you guys are doing awesome. Keep doing a great job, and uh, excited to keep tuning in. Means the most. Coach Mello, have a good rest of your night, man. All right, brother. Appreciate you. See ya. Thank you. Big thank you to Coach Mello for joining us tonight. Had a great conversation with him. Glad to have him back on the show. Was one that uh, is a guy that's joined us uh, in the past. But uh, now moving on here in the Division II realm still, Jimmy, the Javelinas down at Texas A&M Kingsville are at a Division I opponent to the future schedule. Take a look at this. They're locked in. UTRGV for the people. Who is that? University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. There you uh, go. Kobe, there you I go. have an important question for you. What is a Javelina? A Javelina That's a great question. Uh, shout out to Coach Bish, who's been on this show and who I talk with uh, semi-frequently, defensive coordinator down there at uh, Tamuk or Tamuk, whatever the how they sure. go. Sure. Uh, the Javelina is basically like uh, think of like a, a poor man's warthog. I think yeah. I, is the best way I could kind of think about it. Yeah. It's uh, a, a pig type creature that's down there, pretty yeah. common down there. They've got one in a, a stuffed, a taxidermied one in a display case in the football office. Yeah, yeah. I'm picking up like Pumbaa from the Lion King a little bit from the logo. <laughs> that's that's actually yeah. that's actually not too far off. No, um, no. I'm I, trying to see if I can uh, pull is up. Is that some like a Central American like animal or something? Like what? 
Uh, not that I know of. Here we go. We've got a picture of an adult and of a small baby javelina. I don't know if they go by a different term when they are young. Boom. What do you think? <laughs> the baby's pretty cute. Poor man's warthog. The baby's pretty cute, dude. But uh, they're still badass. So cute shout out to the baby. javelinas. You see here they've got the deal set up September 4th, 2027. They will be traveling to UTRGV. And uh, this is an interesting one because... They haven't played a D1 in, uh, I believe, since 2016 was the last time uh, that Kingsville has played a Division One squad, and I'm blanking on who exactly that was. But this URT, a uh, UTRGV, good God, I'm going to start referring to them as their uh, their mascot instead. I believe it is the uh, Vaqueros. That's kind of a cool one. And you know what? Do we need to, do we need to pull up another? I think we do. Do we need to potentially I, pull up? Another? I think yeah. that's going to be necessary at this point. Vaquero. Boom. I, yeah, this is something. I okay, need to see. it's like a some type of cowboy kind of take on a on a. It's a Mexican Mexican vaquero. Yeah, so this is like this is kind of the common like across all of them. This is kind of the general image. Oh, this the resolution is awful, but uh, we're gonna roll with it. Okay, you get the idea, I, yeah, I, right? I, the I'm idea, the it. idea is there. That's our vaquero. Sure. He's pretty badass. Fits the kind of Texas Mexican theme we got going on down there. It's all, all well and good. Anyways, Javelinas Vaqueros in 2027, September 4th. Uh, they will travel to their home campus. It's in Edinburgh to play at uh, Robert and Janet Vacar Stadium or Satellite Campus in Brownsville to play at Sam's Memorial Stadium. Neither location has been performed, confirmed. Excuse me. So this is an interesting n- piece of news because the Vaqueros are reestablishing a football program. It's been dormant since 1950. So they had a program, 1950, cut it off. Now they're bringing it back, uh, what, 70 years later, 70-odd years later? So an interesting situation down there in Texas. And they used to be actually, they used to go by the University of Texas Pan American. They will have a full exhibition schedule in 2024. They'll officially begin play in conference as a member of the Southland Conference in 2025. So this year for them is all scrimmages. They're probably are redshirting a bunch of kids, bring, you know, trying to bring in that class as a lot of new teams and new programs do. And then 2025, they'll start in the Southland Conference as an official member. This game, though, not until 2027. I wonder, <clears throat> so you said they're like scrimmaging and practicing. I wonder if what those kids' eligibility rules are for the NCAA. Ah, that's a good question. I believe it's all the same. So would you go there and waste a year of eligibility or what? How would that work? Yeah, so I'm, I mean, that's a good – I, I, again, this is for me. I'm just assuming it's all in the same. If you're scrimmaging against other teams, like you're using – because you have that clock, right? You have your, like, 10 semesters or whatever clock of once you get enrolled into classes at a, an NCA institution or whatever that is, it's just a college institution. And um, I would assume, again, assume in this case, it's a bunch of guys that are using red shirts. Right, and they redshirt a whole class, and they go through this. That's uh, we talked about Calvin University in Michigan, a new D three team, addition to the MIAA. They're doing they're going through the same thing right now. Uh, Rio Grande, yes, that's how they say it in Ohio. Uh, yeah, yeah, not Rio, Rio. Um, and they got a bass fishing team we talked about a while back. But uh, they're doing the same thing right now, an AI squad. So they're a lot of the Red Storms. There's a lot of teams going through this right now. I'd imagine eligibility wise, it's an interesting. Interesting piece, but the uh, Javelina is only the second program that have announced non-conference games against the Vaqueros. Texas State is also, uh, they have dates for 2027 and 2030. 2030. What the hell, dude? Hey, they're thinking ahead. I mean, I like it, but oh my goodness. So, looking at the Javelinas, though, this past year, I mean, the squad was 7-3 and three in 2023. They were uh, up there in the Lone Star Conference. Obviously, not. Uh, they were behind the uh, UT Permian Basin. UTPB had a, a really solid year. We've talked about them quite a bit on this show. Uh, Central Washington, they met in the championship in that conference. But uh, 2024 schedule for the Javelinas is interesting. They uh, open up with some, with some pretty decent out-of-conference games. They go at home against Colorado Mesa, and they go on the road to Mississippi College. You got an RMAC and a GSC contest mixed in there. You're thrown right into the thick of it at UTPB, uh, the reigning conference champs. That's going to be a a really fun one. Week three, I believe. Week four, because they got a bye week working there. Week four for the Javelinas. Sol Ross State, Jimmy, a Division three team, making the jump to Division two in the Lone Star. They have their first official season in the Lone Star as well, so they'll play uh, the Javelinas in week number five. Big time. I did not know there was going to be a D3 jumping up to D2. Yeah, so we had a D3 jump to D2. We had an NAI, obviously, Roosevelt joining the GLIAC. So two yep. teams uh, that made that jump. So that's the news 
on the Javelinas. Let's move over and talk potentially about the best transfer portal classes in all of NAIA this year. Once again, this recording to our, our according, excuse me, not recording. We're the ones recording. This according to our friends over at uh, Athlinked. And uh, looking at these rankings right here i'll read a couple of them off just so the the people at home can get a get a sense we'll just go top 10 right now because a couple of them have actually changed since the post of this but the top 10 have stayed uh large with this sam we got florida memorial coming in at number one lawrence tech downstate how about southeastern carroll out west marion another midwest squad cumberland bethel we've got warner reinhardt and uh u pike that's our our top 10 there if you will and uh when you kind of break down, let's look at ex what exactly these guys are are bringing in, and we can start with Florida Memorial. They're bringing in some uh, a few guys that uh, have some really good kind of. They're highly rated on this scoring system. One of them was a previous preferred walk on Oklahoma, a running back. They're bringing into that offensive backfield, so obviously that's gonna you would assume translate very well to this level. Uh, you'd assume a guy that probably wants to get a few bit more playing time. Bringing in a wide receiver from Hampton that's got a big time rating. They're really excited about him and a tight end from Lane College, the D two level and HBCU. So those are some of the additions from Florida Memorial that have them ranked that high. And I think with this too. The net rating of these squads, the way Athlon kind of determines this too, is it's taking those additions. Also, what are you losing, right? And you'll find that these teams at the top are not actually losing a lot, at least to the portal, right? Losing to graduation is a totally different, uh, different peel, different, uh, different deal. Excuse me, different can of worms. But uh, Lawrence Tech, you're bringing in uh, some guys. How about a quarterback from Lafayette? That feels like a big time move, Division One level, coming down to play uh, QB. There, you've got uh, two different couple, actually maybe three different GLIAC guys making the move down to uh, Lawrence Tech and then uh, running back from Kalamazoo in the MIAA. So a host of guys, once again, coming down a level, probably trying to get a little bit more playing time and uh, and show out on a different stage. So that's exciting stuff for them. They, they, they've struggled. Like they've they've realistically struggled. They had a year or two where they were semi-competent. They got a new coaching staff down there and Coach Merchant, who was the head coach of Chippewa Valley. You're probably not familiar, Jim, but it's a big-time Michigan high school oh, football yeah. program. Um, and once again, According to our, our source here, losing one guy in the portal, a tight end. Like, that's uh, bringing in guys is great, but how do you retain guys? And I know Lawrence Tech's not working the big roster right now because of the new coach, and you probably had a, you know, a pretty good exodus there, but uh, they're working with what they got down there. And then to round things off, down in Florida, Southeastern, they bring in a quarterback from Gannon. They've got a running back from Sanford, and then a linebacker from Carson Newman. That's kind of their top trio of some talent that they're bringing in down there. Um, so that's uh, that's some big time stuff. Had a DB and a linebacker leave in the portal, but they uh, they feel pretty good about what they've got. That's the top three. Uh, if you guys want, we can always do some more in depth stuff. I've been I've been toying with the idea of doing like some Twitter Spaces, Ooh. or even hopping back in that Discord and doing like some yeah. some calls of that. Actually, the Twitter Space idea would seem like a, a seems like a fun one to me of like getting like some of that more niche stuff, just getting out there and talking about it. I feel like that'd be cool. But let us know what you'd like to see transfer portal wise. Or any deep dives you'd like to see, any uh, you know, breakdowns or different teams, rankings, comp compilations, wh whatever it is. Like let us know. Uh, hopefully we can help you out with those resources. But uh, we do also have, since the game is out today, this little piece from D3 Sports Data, which they do that's some great stuff. Sweet, this man. thing is that's cool, that's really cool. That's really cool. Obviously, like totally uh, mocked off the the official one. Even down to the poses, the attention to detail, dude, on the helmets and jerseys, the names. Who better than Zach Boys is to be right in the front and center of this thing with Lane in, deservedly so, right off to his left? Yeah, pretty sweet. Pretty good lineup right there. Yeah. The attention to detail on the helmets, too. How many can you, you pick out quite a few? Yeah. Even from behind. I see Studer there from lacrosse. You can see quite a, I see a Warhawks one up in there, too, to yeah. up, up into the middle of the right there. Yeah. There's quite a few. There's some good ones. So, I like that. If you were uh, if you were starting a dynasty today of the D three football team, outside of Stout, who would it be? Who you start? Who you starting a dynasty with? Hmm. Birmingham Southern feels like the layup here. No, I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna think a little bit here because I wouldn't pick like a powerhouse. Obviously, I, you don't want no, like, again. Yeah, you don't want to pick like a North Central. Yeah. Or like nobody a, picks Bama when they go into no, the game, you right? Can't yeah, do that. you're not you're you not picking pick, you're yeah, not picking yeah. Mount Union to start building a dynasty. No. no. But you don't want to go all the way to the yeah, other end of the You don't want to be, spectrum. like, too bad. Okay, okay. I'm kind of on the spot here. Jeez. Okay. I feel like it's a good question. It's a valid oh, it question. I, I got to, like, give me, like, another 10 seconds here. Okay. Yeah. Can we get the cue of the countdown? 
sure. the... <laughs> I'm trying to think. Yeah, like you said, like a semi middle of the road team. That's like Ooh. a. Oh, okay. No, no, no. I got it. Who's Bened- that? Benedictine. Benedictine would be a good because, one. Because let me tell you why. Because okay. Because shout out to my friends over at Throw Deep. Uh, my th- my coaches at home at Throw Deep are the offensive coordinator and the quarterback coach at Benedictine. Okay. And I know I already know their offense. I mean, basically, to, like to a pretty so decent. So you extent. get on the sticks and you're good to yeah, go. Exactly. Like I already know the system really well. I can start the dynasty. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I I play with Benedictine. They, got, I feel they, like have, they have a really great system. You know, I, I know what they're doing. I so. feel like a fun one would be Linfield. Linfield that might okay. be my pick. Yeah. It's like a, I know it's a pretty t- it's a pretty it's a legit yeah. program. I'm not I'm not exactly building something from nothing out there out west, but mm-hmm. uh Linfield might be my pick. Pretty physical, a lot yeah. of travel. I just feel like that's yeah. a cool it's a cool place to build something out there and then maybe pick up a, a you know, if I'm in my dynasty mode, maybe I pick up another job somewhere else yeah. and go bigger and better. <laughs> but um Linfield might be my pick. But Pretty sure. Yeah, I was uh, I, I was told though. At least it seems like you're going to be able to put your own logo into the game, and make a team based off that. Wow. So whether that's a D three football team, maybe we get the D one R logo on some teams. Wow, now that now now we're talking, go. We should do yeah, we should do uh, a giveaway like t shirt stickers, some random stuff to whoever puts the D one R logo on their EA college yeah. football team. Definitely. That'd, That'd be, be badass. Like a, do you want our community on the video game? Yeah. We could like have our own like Put channel. All, yeah. <laughs> we could like stream on it. That'd be dope. That'd be dope. But uh, hey, a really but, quick one yeah. tonight, but. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say Richie would be all over that because he's already. Yeah. Hell like yeah. yeah. I know. Hopefully get him in here, huh? Yeah, shout out to Richie Murphy, man. Be fun. Get, get his, get his here, ass dude. in here, dude. Yeah, yeah, dude It'd be fun. I'll make sure I have the cameras working when, they, when he comes. Yeah, dude, hopefully he's still in Michigan. I know he was up like. I don't know, like an hour and a half north of here. Yeah. So, like, maybe we'll get him down. We'll see. All right. Make it happen. But thank you, Jim. Yeah, dude. No problem. Quick episode tonight. I appreciate you. Thank yeah. you all for tuning in. It's been episode 169 hey, of D1 Rejects. Camera right here. Camera's so, right there. Oh, for real? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I can see you. Right. Later, guys.